Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. We hope you enjoy today's story. My wife Maria was once again in London, shopping in the stores. With each passing year, she spends more and more time away from home. We are no longer together as a couple, but I cannot bring myself to divorce her, and she has no desire to file for one. Over the past five years, my software development company has soared. For 10 years, I struggled to keep my head above water, and then hardware technologies caught up with my software package, and things started to fall into place. Three major companies showed interest, and I was just waiting for the right one to seize. The actual value now amounted to significantly more than 10 million, mostly in inventory, which I had. About eight years ago, Maria worked at a law firm in Reading. The salary at that time was a significant support. Her working day was long, and in the end, she made several late-night trips for the firm, although I thought she was just a legal assistant. I was preoccupied with new software, so I didn't pay much attention to her absences. Until then, everything between us was fine. Our sex life was great, and we seemed to spend a lot of time together, engaging in activities and enjoying each other's company, even despite my messy habits at work. After she worked at the law firm for about a year, our sex life practically disappeared, and our life together became barely platonic. I was unhappy with the situation, but I was confident it was just a phase she was going through. We had two sons, both attending high school. They largely took care of themselves. Bradley was preparing to attend the University of Pennsylvania, and Scott was eagerly awaiting his service in the Marine Corps. Maria's boss was Robert Logan. I had met him and his wife several times at company events, and he seemed like a normal guy to me. Once, Maria came home very distraught and told me that Robert was dead shot by his wife. She didn't go into any other details, but shortly after that, she resigned and never worked again. Our marriage didn't improve. She became melancholic and prone to fits of rage. I wish I could say there were some positive qualities in her, but I couldn't. I tried to avoid her as much as possible, but it was difficult. To top it off, she was pregnant. I hoped that a new baby would improve our family situation, but it didn't happen. Maria named our newborn daughter Glenda. She adored the girl and was constantly worrying about her, but our relationship continued to deteriorate. As Glenda grew older, Maria began to spend more time away from home. The company was making money, so we moved to a new house with servants. Maria hired a nanny for Glenda and took full advantage of it. I never asked where she went or why. All I knew was that there were many disappointments. Fortunately, I earned money faster than she could spend it, but I was equally disappointed. I tried to talk to her and figure out what had happened between us, but she refused. Of course, separate bedrooms didn't help. I had no idea what I had done wrong, so I didn't know how to fix it. In the end, I just gave up. The divorce cost me millions of dollars and probably would have funded a new company. I was angry with myself for letting it go so far. I had my team of lawyers, but I still hadn't seen a good way out. Glenda grew up into a fine young lady. I spent as much time with her as I could. Maria usually kept us at arm's length, but because she was away so often, Glenda and I became good friends without her knowledge. It was our secret, and Glenda liked it. Now she was in the third grade and doing well. I attended parent-teacher meetings and conferences. Maria was usually busy with other important matters. Bradley and Scott were left to their own devices and were doing great. My marriage was unsuccessful, but my children made up for it. And then one day, luck was on my side. Janet Logan was sitting in my office, waiting for me. I was surprised because I thought she was in prison for killing her husband. She had lost a lot of weight. Her hair, which was shoulder length, formed a smooth cascade of reddish brown, somewhat dark strands. She wore very little makeup, and her skin seemed to have a delicate smoothness but was not soft. Her eyebrows were natural and perfectly complemented her face. She appeared both tough and feminine at the same time. Janet, this is, to put it mildly, a surprise. You look good. Thank you, Grayson. I wasn't sure you'd remember me. It's been eight years, and I was convinced no one would remember me. Would you like some coffee? Black would be great. Janet, I'm in a very awkward position here. I'm aware of your situation, and I don't want to discuss anything that might upset you. If I say or do anything inappropriate, please don't hesitate to correct me. I spent the last eight years in prison, Grayson. I'm pretty calm about all of this. Don't worry about my feelings. By the way, how's Mrs. Stevens doing? This isn't what I want to talk about. 
Let's just say things could have been better. I'm sorry, but that's the reason I came to you. I need to talk to you about Maria. I'm not vindictive, but there are some things that, as I feel, need resolution. I placed a cup of coffee in front of her but sat down at the table next to mine, not behind it. I wanted to hear what she had to say, and I wanted her to feel comfortable while she did it. I pressed the intercom button and instructed my secretary not to interrupt us. Grayson, have you been following the process at all? No, Maria mentioned what happened, but I didn't have much interest myself. I was busy with business endeavors, and she wasn't very talkative at the time. I think she was upset about his death. I think more than you could imagine. It seems you have no idea what was going on, so much of this will be shocking for you. You said you didn't want to upset me, well, I feel the same. I intend to explain things to you that are unpleasant to hear. If it becomes too difficult, just tell me, and I'll stop. Maybe we should have a little scotch instead of coffee? We both chuckled slightly. On the day I shot Robert, he was planning to leave me and run away with Marcy. Robert stayed home just long enough to give me divorce papers. Your wife was waiting in the car. They were going to visit you after they finished with me. I had known about their affair for some time, and I had documents and several photographs. The fact that he asked for a divorce didn't bother me because I was planning the same thing. Janet, I had no idea. At that time, I was living in my own little world. I think in some sense it was my fault that all this happened. I regret that my poor performance as a husband contributed to your family problems. That wasn't all, Grayson. Robert always wanted a family, but we couldn't have children. He constantly complained about my shortcomings as a wife and blamed me for everything. When he handed me divorce papers, he told me that Marcy was pregnant with his child and that she was going to provide him with the family he always dreamed of. I turned away and started to leave, but he continued to insult me and call me all sorts of derogatory names. It wasn't enough for him to leave and divorce me. He insisted on making me feel like I wasn't even a decent person. It seemed like he would never stop tormenting me, and eventually, I snapped, went to the buffet drawer, and pulled out the revolver. I don't remember how I shot him. You mean to say that my daughter, Glenda, belongs to Robert? Glenda is not Robert's daughter, but I would assume that Marcy considers her to be so. Can you explain that? I've checked several times. The brothers never found anything wrong with me. Eventually, I tested a sample of Robert's sperm, and it turned out to be absolutely sterile. I never told him about it. By the way, Glenda is Robert's mother's name. I suppose that was the name they agreed upon when Marcy found out she was pregnant. Marcy chose that name, but I had no idea where she got it from. I think you're right, and she believes Glenda is Robert's child. Knowing that explains a lot. Would you like some more coffee? No, but I need to discuss something else. Are you sure you have time? Of course. Don't worry about anything. That's the best part about being the boss. When I went to prison, all the belongings in the house were put in storage. Robert's briefcase was among them. I was going through it last week and found this. Janet handed me the original divorce papers that Marcy was supposed to give me on the day Robert was shot. The papers were signed, dated, and notarized. Robert and Marcy worked at a law firm, so the terms of the divorce were very precisely laid out. Is this still valid? Janet laughed. I have no idea. I'm not a lawyer. Look at paragraph 7. She's granting me full custody of all the children. Oh wow, she'll be really mad if she finds out I can get Glenda. Sure. The boys are long gone, but if I can get custody of her little angel, she'll go ballistic. Can I take this so my lawyers can look it over? It's yours, Grady. It holds no value to me. I wish you all the best. Here are a few more things that might interest you, or might not. Janet handed me two envelopes made of heavy paper. The photos my detective took are in the small envelope. They're quite explicit. I don't need them, but they might be useful to you. In the larger envelope are the results of the investigation my private detective provided me, along with some other interesting documents. You can review them and decide what's important to you. Thank you. I really don't want to look at them, but I'll pass them along to the attorney along with the papers. We both sat and looked at each other for a few moments. She was a very impressive woman, and I was glad she came to see me. I'll better go and let you get back to work. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. I feel better when I'm done with this. By the way, you don't happen to have any vacancies for ex-convicts, do you? Seymour Schlamp, my personal and favorite lawyer, was thrilled with the eight-year-old divorce documents, which had no expiration date. 
He was like a kid in a candy store, eager to get to work. Marcy wasn't asking for any interest, just hard figures. She wanted to get $14,000 from current and savings accounts. Eight years ago, that was about half the total amount, and today, almost nothing. All other demands were similar. There was just one snag. She wanted a 1995 Volvo station wagon, which she had at the time. I sold it about five years ago. I had to find that car. Janet Logan started working in the software testing department of the company. It was an entry-level job, but I felt she would be comfortable with it. It also gave me the opportunity to see her regularly. I liked Janet, and I hoped to get to know her better. Glenda and I kept our DNA tests a secret from Marcy. It would take a few weeks to get the results, but Seymour needed time to make sure there were no loopholes in the divorce documents. I was sure the results would show that Glenda was mine. With a little help from friends, I managed to find the Volvo at the State College. A guy from a student fraternity was happy to offer it to me at twice the price he paid for it. A week later, I had a car with Marcy's name on the documents. Seymour explained to me that as long as nothing had been altered in the original divorce petition, it could proceed in written form. We couldn't find anything significant enough to make us want to change it. Marcy's signature had been notarized and was still legally valid even after eight years. I signed for myself, and Seymour's notary stamped it. Now all we had to do was wait. Time dragged very slowly. My relationship with my wife didn't improve. My relationship with my daughter grew stronger every day. My relationship with Janet Logan grew stronger every day. About a month later, I persuaded Janet to have lunch with me during non-working hours. It was pleasant, with no strings attached, and I assured her that I wouldn't do anything to show other colleagues that I was interested in her. She replied that her relationship with me was more important than her job. I had a feeling that everything would work out, but I wasn't going to rush anything. Over the next few weeks, I tried several times to talk to Marcy about our marriage. She refused to engage in any discussions or even answer questions. I didn't tell her that her divorce petition with me was in the process of being considered and that she would soon be notified that it was final. It was midweek and midday when my loving wife, Marcy, burst into the office. What the hell is this? She demanded, throwing some official-looking papers onto my desk. I'm not sure, but I believe it's the divorce petition you filed eight years ago, just notarized, I replied. You son of a bitch. You can't do this. Everything has changed since then, and if you think I'm going to let this shit slide, you're insane. What has changed, dear? Just because your lover died doesn't mean we couldn't continue the divorce proceedings. I agreed to all your terms, so you have no grounds to protest. I suggest you hire a lawyer if you want to contest the divorce, and in the meantime, I'd like you to take all your belongings from my house that you gave me. I'll gladly get out of your house and throw away this piece of shit divorce notice. You'll pay, and you'll pay big. Glenda and I won't be here today, and I'll send someone for my things tomorrow. Sorry, dear, but if you read paragraph 7, you'll notice that you granted me full custody of Glenda. Until you sort that out, she's mine. If you try to take Glenda without my permission, I'll have you arrested. I promise. By this time, Marcy was boiling with anger. All her words were not spoken but shouted. The muscles in her neck were tensed, and the veins on her forehead bulged. Her lips trembled every time she spoke. For the next minute, I didn't hear what she said. I just stood there, stunned by her fury. Finally, she grabbed the papers and stormed out. The silence and tranquility were wonderful. I sat there completely relaxed and relieved when my secretary brought me a cup of coffee. She didn't say anything, just smiled. I spent the rest of the day canceling cell phones, credit cards, bank accounts, and insurance policies. I called Janet, and she agreed to have dinner with Glenda and me that evening. I needed a friendly shoulder to lean on. Glenda and Janet spent most of the evening talking to each other. Everything didn't go as planned. Seymour called me a few days later. Marcy had hired a lawyer, and a meeting was scheduled to resolve the divorce issues. A family court judge was going to be present at the hearing and act as an arbitrator. Seymour indicated that Marcy's attorney seemed not particularly confident in overturning the divorce decision, but appeared more interested in getting me to relinquish custody of Glenda as an addendum. I agreed to compromise but not to concede. The meeting began slowly and consisted mainly of discussing each of the demands that Marcy had put forth in the divorce petition. Seymour handed out checks for the agreed-upon amounts, and we sat quietly enduring the official protests related to the fairness of the settlement. Seymour didn't react in any way. 
Marcy seemed shocked when I handed over the car keys and documents for the Volvo across the table. Finally, the issue of custody was raised. Marcy asked the judge if she could make a statement that had been approved. For the past eight years, I have forced myself to live in a loveless marriage for the sake of my daughter. I loved Robert Logan with all my heart and was proud to give him a child that his wife couldn't bear for him. Robert Logan is the father of my daughter, not Grady Stevens. Mr. Stevens has no rights over Glenda, and I will not tolerate having the daughter of the man I loved raised by a stranger. Based on this, I am seeking sole custody of Glenda Stevens. The judge, who had been silent throughout the entire proceedings, spoke up. Mrs. Stevens, are you suggesting that Glenda Stevens is the result of marital infidelity that occurred between you and Robert Logan while you were married to Grady Stevens? Yes, Your Honor. The way you've put it sounds somewhat demeaning, but Robert Logan and I were lovers and kindred spirits. We never felt like we were engaging in something as dirty as marital infidelity. We were planning or starting our own life together when his tragedy occurred. Glenda is proof of our love, and I don't want Mr. Stevens to have any involvement with her in any way. Your revelation on this matter would typically diminish the likelihood of you obtaining custody due to marital infidelity. However, if what you're saying is true, we may need to reconsider. The judge looked at Seymour. Do you have anything to say? Seymour and I sat and looked at each other. Are you sure you want to do this, Grady? Yes, let's do it. My friendly lawyer slid a sheet of paper across the table to Marcy's attorney. This is a report compiled approximately six weeks before the conception date of Glenda Stevens. As you can see, the report states that Robert Logan had a zero sperm count. Mr. Logan was completely sterile, and he couldn't have fathered a child. That's why Janet Logan, who was capable of conception, couldn't conceive. Marcy paled, and her eyes widened. She began to panic again, much like in my office. This is a lie. This report is not authentic. You're making this up just to steal Robert's child from me. Her lawyer whispered something in her ear, trying to calm her down. Finally, she seemed to relax a bit. Seymour slid three more sheets of paper across the table. The first sheet is the DNA analysis of Glenda Stevens. The second sheet is the DNA analysis of Grady Stevens. The third report is a comparison of the two, which shows that Grady Stevens is undoubtedly the father of Glenda Stevens. Any questions? By this time, Marcy was in tears. She wasn't angry anymore, now she was just crushed. She sobbed uncontrollably as her lawyer requested a brief recess. After the break, my ex-wife's lawyer acknowledged the custody but asked for some visitation agreement. I agreed to allow Marcy to see Glenda every weekend and two holidays of her choice per year. Marcy decided she would like to see Glenda on Christmas and her birthday. The rest of the meeting, Marcy sat quietly. I returned to work without saying anything to her, leaving Seymour to finalize the documents. I couldn't believe how cheaply I got off. If Marcy had been a better wife for even a few years, I would have been willing to share my wealth. I never denied her anything, emotionally or materially. I was ready and able to do anything for her, but somehow, I failed to meet her expectations as a husband. I never understood what Robert Logan had that I didn't, or what he did for her that I couldn't. The photos Janet left didn't show him as anything special in a physical sense. I handed over copies of the photos and the results of Marcy's investigation. Inside the investigation were two reports of Robert meeting other women at motels at the same time he was seeing Marcy. I hoped she enjoyed reading that. All my attempts to get explanations from Marcy were rejected. The divorce left me feeling like a failure. I found some solace in Glenda and Janet. Marcy moved in with Robert's mother, Glenda. Apparently, they had become friends over the past few years. Unfortunately, nothing good came of it for Marcy. To support herself, my ex-wife didn't rush to sell the jewelry and designer clothes she had accumulated on my dime. It took her some time to realize that her lover's mother was doing the same thing. Six months later, Marcy moved out and went to live with her sister in Norristown. At first, Marcy would take Glenda every weekend. Then she started calling and making excuses, saying she couldn't come for various reasons. The calls became more frequent, and the excuses became increasingly ridiculous. Eventually, she just stopped coming altogether. Glenda didn't object when her mother canceled their meetings because Janet and I tried to fill her attention. We spent more time together and began to feel like a family. Janet moved into our home, and we got married just before Christmas.
Marcy went on holiday and embarked on a solo cruise in the Caribbean Sea and couldn't pick up Glenda as planned. Everyone was relieved. Two weeks later, I filed a motion to rescind the additional custody agreement, and it was approved. My company was finally bought, and now we were financially secure. Janet is very happy because she is pregnant for the first time in her life. We will receive social security until the child finishes high school, but it's worth it. Life is finally good. Thank you for being with us and listening until the end. If you found it interesting, please subscribe, give us a like, and leave your comments. And we'll see you on the Cheating Secrets channel.